You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. This is 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. Last week we began a series of interviews with candidates for the Cincinnati Board of Education. The board consists of seven members, each of whom serves a four-year term. On November the 4th, three current members are up for re-election. That includes John Gilligan, Florence Newell, and Rick Williams, which means no open seat exists for this field race. The four non-incumbents who are seeking to oust one of the incumbents include Alan Coleman, Derry Hooks, Robert Killens, and Roy McGrath. I am joined this morning by two of the candidates. Incumbent Rick Williams is completing his second term on the Board of Education. He served as the president of the board in 2001 and 2002, overseeing the selection of Alton Fraley as the superintendent. Robert Killens is making his first run for public office. He is supervisor of corporate contributions and community relations for Procter & Gamble. He serves as the board chair of the Cincinnati Empowerment Corporation and is the father of three children, two of whom are old enough to be students in the Cincinnati Public Schools. Rick, welcome back to Newsmakers. Robert, welcome to Newsmakers. Um, let's begin this morning. Uh, Rick, you oversaw the hiring, as I just mentioned, of the superintendent out in Fraley. We're a little bit, we're basically a year into that. How would you evaluate his performance as superintendent at this point? Uh, I am very, very pleased with his performance and very happy with the fact that we were able to recruit him to Cincinnati. Uh, he is someone who did not apply for that position and we went after him. And it is one of the best things we've ever done. He was able to walk right into the city uh, from another state, lead that bond issue effort and get it passed, uh, assess the district and where it was, and immediately began to create a structure that he felt would make, bring accountability to the district and improve student achievement, which he calls the main thing. So we, I am very, very pleased with uh, having him here. When that process was going on, I had you on this show, and one of the things we talked about, that there was a strategic plan uh, in place, students first, that the, the, the board and the system had been implementing for a number of years. That plan was about to run out in terms of its time frame. A new superintendent has come in. He is making some significant changes in terms of the way that the, the district operates, but there isn't a new plan. It's, it seems like the board has sort of given him the power to make those changes. Is that a correct analysis? Well, I, I think it's appropriate to give the superintendent the power that that position should have. And I f actually believe that he, that there's more authority that should be in that position. But separate from that, from the standpoint of the strategic plan, there is a process being designed to update that plan, to create one for the next five years. But we believe that there has to be some opportunity for this superintendent to actually get a grasp of what this district is about in order for that plan process to continue. And that's why we're beginning that this year instead of last. Okay. Robert, uh, you're a non-incumbent. You're not on the board. Yeah. How would you evaluate the, uh, the performance of the superintendent that we have now out in Fraley? Well, I, I'm impressed with Mr. Fraley. Uh, I've had a chance, um, you know, over the course, especially um, when the between the fail levy and, and then the levy that was passed in May, to encounter him, you know, literally everywhere, uh, really working hard and building credibility. And as I was out ca campaigning, you know, trying to collect my signatures, uh, many of the uh, people who signed on uh, expressed optimism that he had come to town, that they had had a chance to meet him, and felt like he was an authentic person, and so. Uh, from that standpoint, you know, so I think the first half of his of the year was doing the political stuff, trying to get the levy passed, and I think since then um, is is trying to focus on some and tackle, you know, a system that uh, has a lot of challenges that he inherited. So you are a you you want to be a board member, a new board member. How would you change the current board? What would what positions do you hold? What personality traits do you have? that would change the dynamic of the board? How do you, th and how do you, why do you think it would be important that you should become a member of the board? Well, I think that you know, one of the things I bring is a, is a structured approach, you know, working in, um, in done, doing the kind of work I've done, you know, I'm more apt to want to be data, data driven, making sure that the decisions that we're making them, that we're making them for the right reasons, that we do analysis of the various uh, challenges and then develop a plan. 
So I think I bring a, a more structured approach uh, in terms of my thinking. I think one of the things that uh, we have to do is uh, make sure that the board does its job and does it well. The board's job is to provide oversight, to provide governance, to provide a structure. And then the day-to-day -day administration should be uh, within the, uh, the hands of the superintendent. So one of the things I would do is make sure that as we deliberate, uh, that we don't cross that line, not try to get into micromanagement, because we don't need eight do you superintendents. Do you think the current board does cross that line? I think that uh, there's uh, too many meetings. And so I would uh, like to see some of the meetings, uh, you know, cut back on. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of the issues, I'm attending them, you know, regularly now and have been even before attending them, watching them on city cable. Uh, I think that there is um, much that can be done to focus on the bigger issues and let some of the day-to-day -day things that are discussed from time to time le left in the hand of the administration. Rick, what do you think about that? Is, does the board get too involved in day-to-day -day operations that ought to just be in the hands of the superintendent, the, not just the superintendent, but the administration? Uh, Mr. Killens was kind, absolutely. <laughs> There's way too much involvement in the day-to-day. -day. There's not a lot of acceptance of the board role and responsibility of being policy makers and stepping back and letting the superintendent Why be is the that? educational leader. Why is that? Yeah. I think it's about personalities of individual board members. I think that there is a there's a thought that when you become a board member, you instantly become an expert in everything that a board, that a district deals with. I think that, that it, it is purely about an individual accepting what that role is and understanding that it is one of service, you are a public servant, and you are most of the time in the background. And that superintendent is the one who is in the foreground, and he is the leader of the district, because that's where the accountability is. For someone to move their family to another city with young children to go to a new district, that is a huge investment in something where you can't even have the authority that you need to make the decisions where you're being held accountable. And I think that it is critical. Given that this that dynamic that we're talking about and the role of the board, and that's not just structural but also personality, you're running against three incumbents. Yes. The tough question. Who do you want to unseat? Who is the person who ought to be, <laughs> ought, you ought to replace? Well, you know, there are three seats, and, uh, and it's, it's, I'm open. I want to be one of those three votes. I'm, I'm asking people to give me a chance. But I think we Any of the incumbents who are running this time, do you think, aren't doing a good job? Well, I think um, the one incumbent that, I, that I, I think is doing a great job is obviously uh, Rick. Um, but um, for the rest of them, I think it's for the voters to decide, Dan. I, I think it's a combination of, of people that are running now and some that are not running. That, um, uh, that you know, and with the staggered terms, you don't get to evaluate everyone on the sa at the same time. That's true. Yeah. Um, about a decade ago, the business community got, was asked to step forward to evaluate the management, the business side of the system, the Binger Commission. At that time, one of the things that happened was to cut way back on the pe number of people in the central office and send responsibility and power back to building principles. My observation is, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, just from the outside, my observation is that that trend has now shifted back the other way, that uh, Superintendent Fraley is saying that the central office needs to have more direct influence in e every school, cut down the influence of, of of the principals, are we making a shift back, and are we, in the same time, increasing the number of people in the central dis central office? Well, I, I believe that the Bingham Commission started a wave of moving uh, authority, autonomy to the individual schools. That was the beginning of that wave, but I think that pendulum swung too far. So what you're observing is, yes, there are some things that now that we have lived with some of the reforms, some of the programmatic changes that have occurred in the last few years, it is clear that there are some things that need to be central. For example, curriculum. The mobility rate in our district is of such that there are many children who are in three schools in one year. We have to ensure that if you are a third grader, that you are receiving everything you need in whatever school you go to in that third grade. The fact that they, we are standards driven from the standpoint of state and federal guidelines, 
we have now the opportunity to create a district-wide curriculum that can make it better for children and families. That has nothing to do with the input that is critical for all of the sectors of the community. Does that mean we have too many different kinds of curriculums out there? Absolutely. And we have we, no we, consistency, we have very little alignment to the standards, and those are the things that have to be done systematically. Robert, do you agree with that? I would have to agree. Um, I think because, you know, the state doesn't give us a choice. You can take, you know, this exam, if you, if you got run this kind of program or that exam, mm -hmm. it's, it's standard. Now, while I believe there can be some diversity within, uh, you know, teaching methods, the, the curriculum itself, what should be taught, should be standard and, and it should be structured. Then the way you go about approaching it, it to, to accommodate the different learning styles. So you would also agree with this contraction of the number of different types of schools that we have operating? No, that's not the same thing. That is not the same thing. It means that within all those different types of schools of choice, there's an insurance that the curriculum is standard. But the method is what usually is driven so by those would, schools. So we would of end up keeping the same array of options: Paidea, Montessori. We could have uh, more. We could have more. So that's not the problem. Right. It is just the standardization. Yeah, yeah. I would say it's the content. You know, because okay. cause it's the content. In December, we're going to go into negotiations with the teachers. One of the points of controversy over the past several years has been whether to link the new evaluation system to the pay of teachers. Now, originally there was an agreement to do that, then there was a vote by the teachers to pull it back from that. Uh, going into those negotiations, do you support making pay tied to teacher evaluation? And do you make that a priority of your negotiating team? Robert? I think so. I mean, I'm, you know, I've always worked in a system where you have to be accountable and that your, your success, your, your rates, all of those attaches, and I think the average worker is in that kind of a situation, so uh, absolutely. So you would support the, the negotiating team having that as a priority absolutely. to negotiate in. Rick? You know, I'm not so sure that I have that as a top priority. I think that accountability throughout the system <clears throat> is different from an evaluation process for any one type of staff member. And I think that that accountability is a whole lot more important than whether there's pay tied to uh, teacher performance. There are so many decisions that are made by committee. There's such a diffused accountability here. Authority is everywhere. Chiefs everywhere. I would rather get that in check than I would just to have some pay attached to an evaluation system that I'm not quite sure does not hurt the, the system's accountability for performance of students. So. I, I don't have that as a top priority. Okay, well, a point of difference here. So thank you very much, and we're gonna obviously see both of you on election night, and we'll yeah. see where, where this goes. Thanks for being here this morning. Thank you, thank you. Stay tuned, after the break, two candidates for Cincinnati uh, City Council. Thank you. Welcome back. Because of the power of incumbency and the size of the field, I'm interviewing only non-incumbent candidates for Cincinnati City Council. This morning I am joined by Tom Jones, a professional photographer and videographer who is endorsed by the Republican Party. A long-term community activist, Mr. Jones is a former president of both the Avondale Community Council and the Vernon Avenue Business District. And John Schlageter, who is endorsed by the Charter Committee. Mr. Schlageter is an architect who practices locally and teaches interior design at the College of Mount St. Joe. Welcome to Newsmakers. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let's begin by, by just asking Tom, as a non-incumbent, who's observed and interacted with city council for a long time. What's your observation about this city council and what, how good they're doing as a group and what they're not doing well as a group? Well, I've always seen this particular city council as extremely problematic. Priorities are wrong. Um, in simple terms, they just don't get it. Um, uh, there's been so many, so many neighborhoods, so many business groups with so many concerns about the problems that they have in the communities, and those concerns are not being addressed. Um, Do you see this as an, 
too much weight being given to downtown issues versus the neighborhoods? Is that how you would draw that distinction? Well, um, I, I don't think the experience is, is there. Uh, the experience of the, of the council members. Of the, of the council members themselves. Um, these are people that are elected that I haven't seen in the last nine years in the communities themselves. So they don't have a clear-cut understanding of what's actually transpiring in the communities. Only what they read and reports that they get from staff members that have visited those neighborhood meetings. Okay. John, how would you evaluate council as it stands right now? Well, I think on camera they've made more of an effort to get along, but that doesn't necessarily mean more work is getting done. And they've passed a lot of new laws, but 3,000 people a year leave Cincinnati, and I don't think it's because we don't have enough laws on the books. I would agree with Tom. I don't think council members are in the communities enough. Roselawn Community Council, in its questionnaire for its candidates night coming up, asked the candidates, would you commit to attending at least one community council meeting in the next two years? And I think that is a tr tr tremendously low standard to expect from a council member, given that we do run at large. It pays $57,000 a year, which doesn't mean you have to be behind a desk in City Hall counting paper clips. It means you're out in the communities finding out what's going on. One of the sorts of things that's been going on in the community that I know you've been working on, Tom, is this question of how do you make people in the neighborhoods, in the communities, who observe crime, literally, occurring, who may be, may be able to testify about something, feel safe and to come forward and work with the police. I, I, am I right? Is that something you've been working on? That is something I've been working on. Um, over the last six months, um, there's been an escalating uh, concern about people witnessing murders. There's been a lot of murders that have taken place in, uh, in the Over the Rhine area and in uh, Avondale. What's, what's happening? Uh, the police have been saying for a long time, and the prosecution, uh, prosecutor's office that um, they've seen people that have actually uh, witnessed those crimes. They, they have the names. I have the names of 65 individuals who's, who've actually pulled triggers and, I, and killed people. They have, I've gotten those names from people who could testify who don't because they fear retaliation and uh, uh, justly so because they will kill them if they do testify. So uh, this city has not had anything in place because this is uh, something that they're not quite accustomed to. Uh, we came up with the idea of creating a witness protection program uh, six months ago. I wrote a proposal, took it to city council, asked them to partner with the county, the federal government, the Com Hamilton County Commissioner's Office. It didn't move for a long time. Nothing got done. Then finally, um, as the murders kept progressing, um, who Kill Our Kids got behind me. I sponsored them in various initiatives, and it started to happen. Hamilton County is going to fund it. It's going to be... Um, is this a witness protection program that we sort of have the image of the federal witness protection program? We give people new identities, we give them, we move them, we do all of that kind of stuff? Because well, that's very expensive. Well, no, you have to take this uh, case by case. Uh, we're trying to mimic this after programs that have been set up in other cities that have worked, Wa uh, Washington um, State, Baltimore, Philadelphia, okay. Cleveland, that type of thing. John, well, how do you feel about a program like this? Is this the sort of thing the city needs to have, be involved with and can it afford it? Well, I don't know about the affordability given our budget crisis and the fact that in the last 10 years we lost 10 percent of our population, but the annual operating budget is now 40 percent higher than it was at that time. And the Witness Protection Program really speaks to what you do after the crime occurs. City Council has no policy-based crime prevention plan. We have a five-year strategic plan for the police department. We're in the fourth year. It's never been implemented. It's not related at all to the budget priorities that Council establishes. Wait, wait a minute. What, 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 give me a couple of specifics sure. about what is in that plan that has not been implemented. Well, one of the things that we talk about are crime factors. These are environmental variables, according to the FBI, that correlate to the incidence rates and types of crime. 
for instance, one of which is population density. A lot of people try to equate low-income housing with crime. What I found is that the number of empty house buildings in the neighborhood is five times more likely to explain police calls for service than low-income houses. Like in Over the Rhine. Because that's where criminals go to do their business because nobody's going to stop them and that's where they meet. A lot of the homicide victims and perpetrators do not live in the neighborhoods where these crimes occur. We also know, and I'm one of three candidates who's been through the Citizen Police Academy, and I'm president of the Alumni Association, that about 55% of calls for service go to 10% of addresses. These are the hot spots. So if we redeploy our resources, and we have quite a few police officers, we don't support them. D detectives in District 3, where I live, don't have voicemail or email. So we're not giving the police the tools they need to be out on the streets preventing crime before it happens. You know, I think, see, this is one of the problems that I, I think is happening in Cincinnati. City Council and uh, is, is micromanaging the police department it's not working. It hasn't worked. The, uh, the only people that really uh, know what's going on in the neighborhoods are the police officers themselves. City Council is not listening to what's going on. And is it the sort of thing that would, that you're saying that Council should do? Is it the same kind of thing that John's talking about, making sure they've got communications equipment, email? All, is it that kind of support that they need? That's well, one type mm -hmm. of support. Uh, communications is a problem. City can't, will not has not funded up to this point. We have an antiquated communications problem in Cincinnati. Uh, anyway, it's always been fire and uh, and police. Well, I think isn't it that they funded the twenty two million dollars for the emergency communication system, but it hasn't been installed yet. That's what that's what I've read. And a six hundred and fifty thousand dollar phone system that's collecting dust in a basement because there's nowhere to put it. And I, I'll agree with Tom. I mean, we should not be micromanaging the police department. We need as council members to give them strategic direction with citizen input because the citizens also know what's going on. You know, on one of the things that the way this frequently gets put is we need more police on the street. Do we need to hire more police, Tom? Well, I, you know, poli more police is always something that's a good thing. Uh, we're always short-staffed. But I think uh, using the police department to the, uh, to, uh, to the best that you can possibly use them is uh, is a better way to go. I mean, what we what we've been managing to do up to up to this point is preventing the police department from doing their jobs, coming up with different things to more or less put the handcuffs on the police so they they absolutely could not do their jobs. What about that question of, of size of the force? Right. Well, number of bodies is, is a consideration. I looked at 10 cities with similar populations to Cincinnati. This is from the 2001 FBI Uniform Crime Report. And we have 377 citizens for every officer, the average is 601. So we have almost 40% more bodies. The problem is we don't support them. Council does not support them and to be productive. And both of you are saying some of that support is just being behind the police and making sure that they feel, but also it's these concrete things, communications, uh, strategy about how to deploy them. It's all of those sorts of things. Oh, absolutely. The cultural aspects of policing are as important as any of the physical or technological aspects. I, and I'm aware of time here, so let me ask each of you, if you get elected to council, what will be your top priority? John? Well, my top priority has got to be creating economic opportunity because we simply are not going to be able to pay the bills in the near future unless we begin attracting investment into this city that's already projected and how to go do we into do the that? region. Um, my platform leverages what's called the compact city scenario. There are a number of things we can do. Leverage our foreign trade zone, roll back the unvoted property tax millage, create a local bridge act allowing new companies in growth mode to escrow their earnings taxes to collateralize expansion and get through their cash flow problems. Number of things we need to do to rationalize okay. our earnings tax. And Tom, if you're elected, what would be your top priority? My top priority would be to make Cincinnati a safe place. Finding ways in which uh, the citizens can safely get involved with supporting and helping the police department to identify the problems that we're having. Because with your best comprehensive plans for this city and development, economic growth, and those things, unless you make this city a safe place, none of these things will be implemented. Okay, we have just about a minute left. Let me ask each of you again, given this discussion about budget and how to use the resources that we got, do you or don't you support the deal for Convergist and Kroger that went to, to the downtown company? I have to support that. I have to support that deal because uh, Both with, of them? without a downtown, 
you don't have a, uh, a viable uh, community. Okay. John? The Convergence deal will take 15 years to pay for itself. I don't support the process. Would you have voted against it? I would have voted against it mainly because of the way it went through the process. I supported the Kroger deal because we get an asset out of it that we will have for 30 years. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, and Dan. we're going to be watching the next couple of weeks and see you on election night. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week for the Kentucky governor's race. Have a good week. Thank you.